Good day everyone, Andrew Wolf at the Center for Cosmetic Surgery with a very exciting announcement. After much anticipation, Motiva implants have been FDA approved in the US. Um, so let's create a little video to discuss what that means for us as a practice, what does it mean for the industry as a whole, and let's dig into some of the um, differentiating attributes of these implants. First and foremost, what does it mean for an implant to be FDA approved in the US? It means that that device has undergone rigorous examination and has completed a FDA trial, or at least a significant portion of that trial. And so the FDA safety trial for Motiva implants started back in 2018. Um, I'm a clinical investigator for that study, and so I've been using these implants since 2018. I'm now into the sixth year of follow-up for my patients, and I did 44 uh, operations as part of the study. Around the country, 25 uh, surgeons took part in this study, or still taking part in this uh, study, and the augmentation part of this study involves 856 patients um, and a 10-year follow-up. And so, as part of this examination of the implants, once you reach a certain point and can start seeing some real patterns of safety and effectiveness of a device, the FDA can grant FDA approval, which happened last week. And so um, we now can look back at three years of, of very well-established data. We can look at an international track record for these implants and conclude that they are very, very safe. They are very effective at augmenting a breast or replacing pre-existing implants. And they do appear to have some attributes that are improvements on the implants currently available in the US. Uh, the implants that we currently have are excellent implants. They are tried and true. They've been around for quite some time and we've used them with great success, but science advances, uh, materials science has evolved in the time since the implants we are currently using uh, were developed. And so it makes sense that we might see better performance from a more modern device. So let's dig into these implants. First and foremost, there are two different types of implant available to us. They are both a round, non-shaped device. They both have a smooth surface, but they come with different gels and have different properties. And so uh, the first implant we're gonna look at is called the ergonomics, and this is a slightly softer gel. You can see that you get a, a fairly anatomic shape when you stand this implant up, but when you lie it down, it looks nice and round and natural the way a real breast would. There is another device called the uh, Motiva Round, which is less natural in its shape, and so it's going to provide a somewhat more augmented look and a more augmented feel for a patient who chooses those devices. They're both excellent implants. The gels are very, very similar, but the shells have slightly different properties and the gels have different flow characteristics that um, contribute to the way they behave in the body. And so the easiest way to consider it is if you want a breast that looks more natural, you'd probably lean towards an ergonomics implant. If you want a device that has a more augmented look, have more roundness at the upper part of the breast, then that round device may be suitable for you. Obviously, this is the kind of thing that you'd want to discuss with your surgeon, um, but it's nice to have different options available within the same portfolio of excellent implants. Another important characteristic of these implants is the surface property of the implant. And so, Motiva implants have a smooth silk surface. It is a four micron surface that is imprinted onto the device as they're being fabricated. Um, and what that means is, the surface of this implant interfaces with the body in a novel way. Typical smooth implants in the US have a one micron surface. It causes a bit of inflammation um, and it is not always well accepted by the patient's body. That four micron surface is perceived very differently by the cells that create scar tissue around the implant. And so you get less fibrosis, less inflammation. And as, as a result, you get a thinner capsule around Motiva implants on average than you might around a different type of implant. Um, that means that we saw very, very low capsule contracture rates in the study. And capsule contracture is an overabundance of scar tissue that contributes to a firm, distorted, or painful breast. It is one of the most common causes of reoperation for breast augmentation. And it has plagued us with implants since the beginning of breast augmentation surgery. Motiva appears to have found a way to significantly curtail that process. Um, these implants 
in the US in our trial, we saw 0.5% CAPS contracture rate for primary augmentations. Th these numbers have been replicated around the world in very, very large series of studies, um, series of patients performed by outside the US surgeons. And so we can put these implants comfortably beneath the muscle the way we've done it in the US for a long, long time. These implants also behave very well above the muscle for a number of reasons. First and foremost, caps contracture historically has been uh, an increased risk when you put implants above the muscle. These do not appear to have that risk. And other implants tend to ripple a bit more when placed above the muscle. Motiva implants have very low rippling based on the properties of the shell and the gel. And so we have really a broadening of uh, opportunities available to us in terms of how we can use these implants. There are certain patients where going above the muscle may be a really excellent choice, but I uh, personally have been hesitant to do that as a surgeon in the past because I wasn't confident in the behavior of the implants that we've had for quite some time. Motiva implants, based on their improvements in technology, should perform in a better way above the muscle than we have um, with other devices. So that's going to be something that, that will be interesting to see how this increased applicability of, of implants placed above the muscle affects our patients and Im improves results. Okay? Um, another thing to notice for these implants is that they are slightly bluish. And so that blue is what's called a blue seal. It's one of the five or six layers for the round implants. Uh, it's one of those layers that is dipped uh, onto the device as it's being created. And it is a quality uh, assessment in that the implants need to be uniformly colored. And if they're not, then the manufacturers know that that device is not um, appropriate for distribution and they'll pull that implant off the, uh, off the assembly line. So that's another characteristic. These devices are fabricated with what's called a true monoblock technology, meaning the gel, the shell, and the patch are all fused into one structure, and it contributes to uh, very good behavior of the gel and the shell, and it uh, contributes to a very, very low rupture rate for these implants, and that's one of the most significant um, distinctions between these implants and other implants available in the U.S. is the rupture rate is incredibly low. In our study, over six years, there's only one unconfirmed rupture, meaning that there's a patient who had an MRI that shows wrinkling or rupture. She never had surgery to evaluate that, and so there's no confirmation that the device was actually ruptured. That's it. In the entire study of 850 patients over six years, um, a very large study in Europe was done with 2,500 patients over six years, zero ruptures uh, in that study. And so, it appears to be a very, very strong implant structurally. It is also uh, a reflection of the low capsule con capsular contracture rates because a, a tightening of the capsule can fold the implant and that contributes to early failure. So rupture and capsular contracture are linked. A rupture can cause a capsular contracture, but a capsular contracture can also cause a rupture. It's a, it's a kind of a complex interaction there. Um, in any event, very, very strong implants that should last a long time. Um, there is a small chip available in these implants. It's called the Q inside. It is a passive RFID transponder. And for those of you who have a dog who's chipped, you understand the concept. Uh, we have a number, a serial number, essentially imprinted into this device, and it can be read with the appropriate technology. We have a little reader in the office that can interrogate the implant. It gives us the, the serial number of that implant, and then an appropriate party could call the manufacturer and say, hey, I've got a patient with this implant number, and they can tell us who the patient is, they can tell us when that implant was implanted, what the implant is, what's the warranty status of that device, and that's, I consider that to be uh, potentially very, very helpful. Uh, every patient who gets an implant gets a little identification card, and we keep the record as well, but none of those um, record keeping processes are infallible. And what if you lose the card? What if for some reason uh, the data gets corrupted on our system? You would always have the ability to read the device itself, call the manufacturer and figure out what you have. It is optional. Um, in my component of the study of the 44 patients I, I performed surgery on, roughly 80% chose to have that little chip in, included in their implant. I see it as a good thing. I would want it if it was uh, in my implant totally up to you. Like I said, it is, it is entirely optional. Um, 
And so we have devices that appear to be structurally superior to what we have on the market in the U.S. Their performance should allow us to provide better results, uh, better safety, probably a, a broadened opportunity to put implants above the muscle. They are also very useful in revisionary surgery, again, because of that low capsule contracture rate. They may be a real advance in terms of more complex revisions where somebody already has a capsular contracture. Um, I'm looking forward to implementing them in a more broad sense. Um, the data is really, really compelling. I am one of the three authors on the three-year data that just got published, and so I'm pretty familiar with the safety profile of these devices. I'm very excited. And uh, all of the surgeons in the practice are well-versed in these devices, even though I'm the one who's uh, on the study and, and wrote the paper. Everybody is up to speed. The manufacturer is doing a great job of education. Uh, our staff is fully up to speed, so if you have any questions, please reach out. We'd be delighted to talk to you about this, and we look forward to your questions, comments, and seeing you in the future. Have a great day.